Up next, a conversation with Nedum Fresco, Amazon's Vice President of Alexa Devices and Developer Technologies. He's talking with Cerebral Valley co-host James Wilsterby. Ned and Fresco I have here is the Vice President of Echo Devices and the Alexa SDK at Amazon. You work out of the Lab 126 in Sunnyvale, which is famous for incubating many Amazon hardware products, including Kindles, Fire TVs, and Alexa devices. I welcome Nedim, and happy to have you here. Thanks a lot for having me. Great uh, to be here. Tell me a bit about that role at Amazon. I joined Amazon about 11 years ago, going on 12. And, you know, it's been a wild ride of interesting product launches. And I often ask myself, kind of, what kind of company is Amazon? And I always think, you know, we have a really ambitious, long-range view of constantly innovating for customers. But we kind of combine it with this pragmatism of, okay, what are we going to do next? Mm -hmm. In a way, we kind of don't know exactly how to get to our 10-year vision, but we know what to do next, and we kind of learn by doing. So... So my career here has been a lot of shipping, learning, and shipping some more. Well, as you know, Volley, my company, we build on top of the Alexa platform yeah. as one of the endpoints for our games. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about just the genesis of Alexa, how yeah. that came to be. Yeah, so that, that's an interesting story. I mean, um, 10 years ago, when we looked around the consumer electronics landscape, it was almost entirely dedicated to mobile. All the energy went to mobile applications, et cetera. And we looked around and we saw you know, we spend most of our time at home, and yet a lot of this technology has been kind of bypassing and neglecting the home. So, so we thought a product or a set of features for the home was exactly what we needed, which is when we introduced Echo and we introduced Alexa. What was the expectation of it? Did it exceed that uh, original vision or... What did you think? We like to talk at the time about um, inventing the Star Trek computer. So there's definitely an element of an yeah. all-capable AI that could perform any task that you gave it. Um, but our initial attempt, as I was saying, is the initial product. You know, the cylinder that had the microphones that could play music. There was a lot of AI innovation back then in Alexa on the speech recognition side, I would say, mm -hmm. right? But yes, less, absolutely. obviously, on the... I mean, a lot on the NLP side, too, but yeah. now we're in a whole new era of NLP. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, at the time, we started with the Echo. We, we did a couple of other fundamental things that turned out to be uh, incredibly influential. Um, we added all these smart home devices that were mm. just a super fragmented um, environment, all these sensors, cameras, and the like, and we added them to Echo. And what ended up happening is these devices started working in concert with one another mm -hmm. and started to form a single UI despite be coming from all these different brands. And so, so in a way, Alexa acted as this invisible thread that really bound them together. And we called that, after all was said and done, we called it ambient computing because yes. we felt there's like a new way of interacting with technology now. Yeah, let's talk more about how you define ambient computing and yeah. ambient intelligence. I think this is something Amazon talks about a lot in the context yeah, of Alexa. Uh, we'd love to hear more about what that means internally at Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. So so we, we thought that this is a new way of consumers to interact with technology. And usually that's a momentous occasion when you can find something that's a new way of interacting with technology. It's technology that's there when you need it, it's everywhere around you, but it fades into the background when you don't need it. You don't need to learn it. You don't need to um, consult a manual. It's natural in its interactions. And, and it performs real tasks in the real world. So it's AI meeting the real world in a way. Yeah, very interesting. It uh, must have evolved a lot over the years since it launched. I guess it launched in around 2016. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's been a long time now out in the world. Tell us a bit about maybe on the technology side first, like right. what has changed in, in Alexa, and maybe then on the business side, you know, what is the reach of Alexa? So I, I think getting that device ecosystem to work in concert together and getting consumers to accept it has been a really important milestone. And yeah. the numbers really tell this amazing story of hundreds of millions of Alexa devices out there, 400 million smart home devices connected to Alexa, 
35,000, I think um, it's an insane number of <laughs> like device brands. I don't even remember yeah. the number device of models, device models, oh, device brands yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah, have yeah. been onboarded. And so, so it just shows that customers really accepted it. And what it helped us do is we, we figured out what was important to customers. You know, we delivered, you know, facts about um, like how, how how customers are using their yeah Alexis how customers today. are using it so uh, you know getting real time information about the world organizing your smart home which we talked about getting the entertainment you need we felt customers it really resonated with customers and that kind of explains the update yeah that makes sense uh, so i guess now moving into the future with generative ai you've made some announcements of how that will affect alexa or at least what you're yeah. releasing do you want to talk a bit about what you announced recently and yeah. you know what how you know we can talk a bit about just that future of how you add generative ai into an existing deployed ai system yeah absolutely so we recently previewed an Alexa LLM based experience, which to our knowledge, it's obviously built on a large language model, uh, much like the ones you hear about, but integrated with real world actions and real world um, data services. And as far as we know, it's the largest instance of an AI that can do things. We're excited about this because we're really in the golden age of AI at this point, we can all agree on that. And there's so much excitement and new ideas and new techniques forming. We see it as taking that ambient computing vision that's already in people's homes and building on that foundation to make it better. So I guess um, the device itself is very cloud-based system. So does that allow you to incorporate LLMs sort of without having to replace the sort of hardware itself in consumers? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of what our devices do and that kind of technology in the background that I was talking about in ambient computing turns out fits very well into the use cases that are being demonstrated. So, so we feel we have a very good starting point. Yep, that makes sense. So let's talk about maybe like that actual preview that you demoed and where you see that going uh, in right. terms of like what would be a user experience that, with the new LLM version of Alexa that I maybe couldn't have done before with right. the current version? Maybe at the foundation of all of it is an AI that can understand you better and is more resilient to your turns of phrase and how you talk. So we go from trying to talk like the way AI would understand us to just trying to talk like humans. Yep. So that's kind of at the foundation of it. And it kind of unlocks a lot of things that were too cumbersome to do, to do before. Like, I guess, would yeah. that be maybe a more complex, like, smart home command? or yeah, yeah, for example. I mean, smart home is a great example yeah. because I've been talking about this so sure. much. We learned a lot from our customers, and we learned that, you know, no two are alike, basically. And so, you know, I might, I might be living in a two-bedroom apartment. You might be living in a three-story building. We have different rooms, different. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> I hope the very best. <laughs> I wish you the um, best on that front. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think the way... You name your rooms, the way, the number of devices you have and how you use them are, is very different. And so, you know, if I tell Alexa, you know, make it brighter here, you know, the LLM can mm. start in breaking that down for you. Yeah. But then we have to, in the back end of that and in the runtime, trying to figure out what to do about that utterance. We know that it says bright, so we know that lights will be involved. It says here, which means it has to be in the current room, and we have to find the right devices and get them to actuate. And similar things in routines where, you know, you want to say, turn on my, open my blinds every morning at 7 a.m., except the weekend or in the first light um, of the day. And we have to kind of translate that to something that we can action. What are some of the challenges doing this preview and, and, and the hurdles I guess you've run into while yeah. trying to add LLM-based experiences into the Alexa system? At the root of it is, I mean, I'm oversimplifying by a lot, but at the root of it is teaching Alexa about actions that you can take. You know, okay. just we keep coming back to this. Taking AI actions that in the world, right? Actions in the world. And yeah. so, uh, and it's most of the time looks like incorporating APIs um, yep. and, and teaching the AI about APIs. So one thread of thought is kind of understanding that there is such a thing as an LLM-friendly API, and there's a bunch of elements of that, and massaging your APIs to fit that shape so that it, it works better with those models. Yep. And another is about just a huge search space and how to collapse it down. You know, we have so, thousands of APIs, but how do we know which ones to invoke at scale? Got it. 
And I guess, how do you, have you faced like latency constraints uh, given the speed needed for kind of a conversational assistant uh, with voice specifically? And, and maybe also like, are there cost constraints just to deploy this so broadly? Yeah, I think the latency constraints are punishing, yeah. <laughs> I should say. In the current Alexa, we got to roughly one second round trip time. I mean, I'm rounding down a little bit, but not by too much. Roughly uh, one, one second round trip yeah. time for 95% um, of interactions. Yeah. And that's kind of what our customers expect. They expect real-time performance. And you're doing real-time text-to-speech, right? To, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all real-time, and it has to come back almost immediately. You know, so in the LLM world, clearly a lot of the innovation in the, these large models can only run in the cloud, but we sometimes have to stage it. So, for example, for a simple command like turn on the light or pause this music, you're kind of competing with a physical switch, you know, like yeah. pressing a button or... Oh, you know, it has to be fast. It yeah. has to be yeah. as fast as that. So we have some edge models we deploy as a first stage. Very cool. And we try to accelerate those down to the speeds that, um, that customers need. But if it's something bigger, like write me a poem, customers are tolerant about a poem not being immediate. So but turn on the light has to be immediate. Keeping the latency, the, the use case in mind when you are thinking about latency. Yeah, yeah so. absolutely. So ChatGPT, to me, as another maybe assistant in this space, like doesn't have much personalization, right? It doesn't have knowledge about me. I mean, they're starting to add some things around that. Like, how does Alexa think about you know knowing more about me and and kind of maintaining that state uh, over multiple sessions? Yeah, absolutely. So. I think both personalization and person-like behavior are you know, important to us in Alexa. For personalization, we know that even though our devices are communal in nature, you know, they hang out in public areas uh, of the house, it's important to recognize the person that's yeah. speaking and actually tailor the experience to them. So, so we have some technologies uh, such as voice ID and visual ID. So you know, when you ask for your music, you get the music you want and I get the music I want. Or when you say good morning, you get the routine um, uh, you need. So that's one uh, you know, obvious area where we feel it's really important and, and to do you be think, focused. Do you think like, as you move into this LLM first world for Alexa, like the personalization piece is really important? Yes, okay. it will continue to be important. Yeah. I mean, customers have told us, like, we don't have to imagine these things at right. this point. There's so much customer adoption. And they tell us when, when we act on their behalf specifically, and they can tell. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> I guess let's talk, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, speech recognition and how that was maybe an enabling technology in the beginning of right. Alexa. Does anything with LLM experiences on Alexa have to affect a ASR and speech recognition or the user experience of using voice for maybe a longer conversation? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been overhauling our speech recognition systems as well as our text-to-speech systems to to change in the light of an LLM. You know, we're, we're now encouraging much longer unbounded conversations. So in addition to training these models on command-like sequences, we're also training them in long sequences. We also realize that we have to be resilient to how people speak when it's a long utterance. You know, you're going to pause, you're going to think of the next thing to say. Sometimes you might say, um, you know, sometimes you might even stutter. And so we're building models that are resilient to those pauses and, uh, and that way we don't prematurely interrupt you as, as you're talking. So for people with Alexis today, like that experience, if they are trying out the preview, will eventually kind of enable those new types of user experience. Yes, absolutely. Here. Yep. Cool. So let's talk about, I guess, yeah, your vision maybe and differentiation of super LLM-based assistant and I guess Alexa as a assistant personality. Like, how do you differentiate your vision on Alexa versus maybe other uh, chat-based assistants or uh, LLM-based assistants out there in the world? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's important to emphasize that we're after a single, all-capable um, general-purpose AI that's personalized to okay. you. And so no matter how we decompose that behind the scenes, we do want to present a single AI to users. Me meaning you expect customers to invoke Alexa specifically as the entry point. As the entry yeah. point, and we don't want them to muck with, you know, which agent would I call for what right. kind of expertise. We want them to just talk. 
and, and we'll, we'll figure it out behind the scenes. And, and you know, when we decompose, we obviously have a combination of models and a combination of runtime systems, but we want to really keep it transparent. So, so this concept of like multi-agent systems, or like you said, like there's, you're going to have one agent that calls another expert on that domain, you're, you're less bullish on that, I guess. Can you, can you talk more about why you think that, that that model isn't as you know compelling to the super agent, or is it more just customer expectation? I think it's the latter. Yeah. I mean, we, we try to couch all of our technological decisions on what we think is best for customers. We think that customers are easily confused when you have to just switch them back and forth. In fact, what really characterizes these models, what makes them so awesome, is the fact that you can go from task to task, and there's no switching, there's no searching. You just go from topic to topic, just like you do when, when, when you talk normally. And yeah. so, so that single entry point, we believe, is what customers need. It, it increases some, you know, like the technical difficulty of getting there in, in a lot of ways, but it's okay. I mean, that's, that's the product we think we need. Very interesting. So let's talk about, I guess, developers and like as, as we are a developer at Bali on the Alexa ecosystem. Why should developers uh, want to partner with Alexa and build on top of Alexa and then Maybe you can talk a bit about you know, what this new developer experience might look like in the world of LLMs. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that, that intro around a single consumer-facing assistant that brings in all these functionalities and has all of the quote-unquote middleware that, that, that gets that personality implemented, yeah. I think that's really important to understand our developer picture as well. Mm -hmm. So our developers extend those functions that are kind of accessed through that single entry point. You know, and we have a lot of developer types. We obviously have, we have more than a million registered uh, developers out there, so developers have always been important to us. But in this world, you don't want to treat them as like one blob of a single community, because they do very different things. For example, we have content developers. You know, you're a music provider, you're going to add your music to Alexa. Well, the way you give us our catal your catalog, the way you add additional capabilities is one kind of developer. You know, if you're a smart home developer and you want to add your new device okay. uh, to Alexa, you're another kind of developer. Okay. And so a content developer, for example, is going to get better with LLMs because you're going to be able to be more conversational in how you ask for music, for example, and that's going to benefit all our partners as well. And maybe for that type of developer, there isn't as much a lift on their end to integrate that in a world of LLMs if they're able yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think the, the developer opportunity is twofold. One is the experience, a lot of the constraints on the experience that we had, user-facing experience, are much eased. Yes. So, so people are just much more natural in the way they speak, which just in, in, you know enlarges the opportunity. Could, could, could lift all boats on yeah, Alexa, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. it's good for all of us. Yes. And then the developer burden is coming down as well. You know, a contribution of this new golden age is that you know what developers do has changed drastically, and right. it's just gonna go down by a lot to much more manageable uh, um, state. So yeah, I think that's an interesting vision to think about the developer community and have different entry points to the Alexa for different types of developers yeah. makes sense. I guess like, can you talk about a little bit further in the future? So we're entering this preview of the LLM-based conversation experience in Alexa. Like, where do you where are you trying to get this to? You know, how should people be expecting their Alexa to improve? You know, in, in a longer time frame. I'm just yeah. interested in the the, the longer term picture. Yeah, I think uh, there's probably a, an easy way to summarize this. It's an Alexa that will understand you better. It can hold up a longer conversation, more cross-topic, capable of more tasks, more personalized, more natural, a, a lot of mores <laughs> strung together. Yeah. And I think, as you said, it is a tide that lifts all boats. It helps our developer partners for sure, and it helps um, our features as well. And it, it kind of advances that consumer vision that we have of an AI that's capable of everything and capable of taking, uh, taking action. Becoming more ambient in the same and, time. And, and the ambient you know, backbone continues. You know, we, we, we want to be everywhere, and we want to be able to uh, be ready for you when you need us. And, and I guess maybe just as a last question here, like, is your belief been consistent that voice is the correct way to interact with these types of uh, very intelligent assistants, as well as you know, right. what we have earlier, like voice is an important, really important role, uh, important in the interface? Our, our starting point was voice, right. and it turned out to be very, very powerful. In a way, the beginning of ambient intelligence is 
you're just talking to get something done. Yeah. You don't, you're not even paying attention to which device you're talking to. In fact, you might have a few in the room and you don't, you don't know and you don't care. Um, but we found that the, as the use cases became richer, touch definitely has yes. a role. And in fact, even sensors have a role because you want to get to a stage where Alexa can take action on your behalf without you even asking. You know, automations and routines are, uh, you know, have a role. We just want all of those, not just any one of them, but the uh, intent remains the same. You want it to be ambient and you want it to be easy to use. Makes sense. I'm excited for that vision. Thank you so much for being here, Nenem. Thanks for having me. Silicon Valley.